Welcome to this episode of the Level Design Podcast. I am Mark Drew, and in this episode, we're taking a slight deviation from our usual roundtable to talk to a very special guest. In this episode, we're going to be talking to Juju Adams, the king of the game maker development engine and guru of all things Hyperlight Drifter and what other games. So, Juju, welcome to the podcast. Hello, Mark. What an introduction. Yeah. The king, what would you say, the guru of all things Hyperlight Drifter? Yeah. Oh, no. That, that credit would have to go to Alex. I think the yeah, guy right. who directed the whole thing. For sure. Um, but in terms of dealing with some of the level design and some of the, the level design tools, yeah, that's, that's definitely my forte. Okay, yeah, well, that's why you're on the podcast, right? Yeah. You've yeah. also worked on other stuff, right? So yeah, yeah. Obviously, yeah. I mean, I don't want to just say that you're the hyper light. Oh, man, that, that, that's <laughs> such a burden to bear. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I worked on a game called Swords of Ditto, and right. then Rivals of Ether, uh-huh. uh, which is... And these are more, um, how would you describe them, low pixely games? So low? Rivals of Ether is pixely, yeah, and okay. Hyperlight Drift is obviously quite pixely, but yeah. Swords of Ditto is much more high fidelity, it's much okay. smoother, more cartoony. Um, the artist, the animator that we got in for that was a guy who works on Adult Swim products. Oh, okay, um, right. And he's currently working on Battletoads now, the new oh, remake. Oh, right, okay, yeah, yeah, I saw so that was, um... I'm gonna butcher her name, but Lucy Cracky uh No, result? yes, yeah, she is working on it. But um, oh man, what's the guy's name? Alex, Alex Berry. Right. Yeah. So he he did some he did all the animation for Swords of Ditto. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. So he was uh, yeah he was a really fun guy to work with. I think Swords of Ditto was actually his first game. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong because I probably am. I've played Hyperlight Drifter like for ten minutes. I think it was was not for very long. But yeah. is it what, what would you call it? It's a two point five. Oh, yeah. it's I mean, right. architecturally, it's really interesting with the perspectives, right? Yeah. So Hyperlight Drifter is an indie game uh, that was released in 2016, uh, eight, April sometime, I think, late March, can't remember, but springtime, 2016. And it, I describe it as a Zelda game with the heart and soul of a 21st century slash slasher okay. game, right? Like, like, like a Dark, but, I mean, Dark Souls gets mentioned a lot with Hyperlight, and I think that is justified. But there's more to it than that. I think right. the aesthetic sensibilities are, you know, like they. Yeah, they then it's not. It doesn't look like Dark Souls. It, no, it, it's not very s- bright, and colorful, bright color really. neon sci-fi yeah. kind of. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it really borrows a lot from seventies, right. mid-seventies sci-fi. Um, so it's it's all of these wonderful mixture of things all brought together, but it's very hard, in my opinion, as one person. Uh, it, it feels very Zelda-like to me. Right. Um, so you're running, you're slashing, you're using some other objects that you collect along the way, uh-huh. you go to dungeons, you explore the overworld, and then you fight the big bad at the end of the game, and you have a bittersweet victory. Okay. Uh, and it's, it's a beautiful game, and I think something that, that really makes it sing are the environments. Right. Um, I remember, I'm actually getting... Uh, you, yeah, I can say, it, listeners at home, yeah. <laughs> my, my hair's are standing up on my arm. There's a particular scene, I think everyone who, who's played the game will probably... At least got this far in the game, will remember yeah. it. As you go up this mountain, uh, as you go north from the starting area, as you go up this mountain, you work your way up, and the music builds and builds and builds and builds and builds. There's this great pregnancy to, mm-hmm. to, to the audio, and you're, you're literally ascending, right? Mm-hmm. And you get to the top, and you go over the crest, and the music breaks. It's this beautiful moment, and you see this looming, this, this you know, 100 story tall giant wow. dead collapsed against a mountain, and it is bigger than the mountain. Right. And and this this I actually genuinely yeah, yeah no there's I and can it's see book, some yeah, one of the most moving things I've ever experienced um, and that kind of environmental design is what excites me and right. I'm not a level designer I'm a programmer right you know I'm just I'm just a simpleton you know um, no, yeah right yeah it's those things that make me excited I think about games um, and being a part of that process yeah. is is what gives me yeah, energy it's kind of interesting being able to play a game both as a designer. Uh, you know, and, and I say that in a, in a very wide right. Yeah, design in, is a lot in, of things. In, right, in yeah. a designer, a programmer, or whatever, being the person that sees behind a curtain, right, and as a player at the same time, and be able to to have those both feelings, you know. Yeah. Um, it's feelings. You're right. It's an emotional connection. Right. Um, that that these games kind of drive out of us, and and I think, well, they attribute many things to level design. They, they say, oh, that's a great level, but it's actually they're talking about the environment art rather than the, yeah, the yeah. environment storytelling rather yeah. than the actual design of, yeah. of the level. I think what was really clever about this moment in Hyperlight when you go up this mountain, mm. um, yeah, the environment design is fantastic, right? Or, you know, how it's all composed and put together. But it is the, the way that they've placed challenges and the way it's guided mm-hmm. you physically, how you've moved, your motion 
becomes it starts quite serpentine so you're mm. moving from left to right and left to right so you wind up this mountain mm. and as you get to the top the your 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 side winding behavior becomes narrower so it you're goes much faster yeah. yeah you're physically like getting to an apex right and environment design doesn't or environment art doesn't do that that's not the job of the environmental artist right that's a level design thing exactly um and how do the to to do that you have to have, that for that was that planned beforehand or was that a, a, something that emerged out of design i honestly don't know okay. um and I've, I've spent a fair amount of time talking to the various members who mm -hmm. of, of, of heart machine who who did all this stuff and i get the impression it was half designed and and half they felt their way through it Mm -hmm. And that's the hallmark of, I personally, I think true greatness is mm -hmm. when you're both aware of what you're doing, but subconsciously are, are striving for something in the distance. Mm -hmm. So, you know, every moment to moment, you understand the mechanics of your moment to moment design. And then, you know, off in the future, there's this, there's this great moment that you're trying to build towards and your brain, <laughs> you're the, you know, the, the, the mind of a, of a, of a brilliant person or inspired person just kind of melds these things together. Yeah. Um, so I think it is half and half. I think that was one of the the, the GDC talks about Journey, uh, the game Journey, which oh, yeah. they were talking about, which was I've never played it. Uh, the, uh, is it's is a very beautiful game. I mean, uh -huh. but one of the things that, that they planned was uh, the each level was planned with this in, with a long term goal in mind, as well as a coloring. Of oh, each area, right? Okay, so they yeah, could, yeah. they showed some diagrams of like like this is level one, level two, level three, level four, all the way through the game. So they actually storyboarded it, and they storyboarded it, but uh, <gasps> but uh, in a way like a chart, like a beat chart. Uh, yeah, through. right. Yeah, and you're yeah, like, yeah. oh wow, okay. So you did plan everything, like you had this whole strategy as well as the, the yeah. tactical area yeah, by area, yeah. uh, moment by moment. Um, what was your role on 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 uh, on Hyperlight? Hi yeah, so. I came in after the game was released, um, just as you know, just as it had been released. And the two, uh, two of the programmers, Bo and Teddy, uh, moved on to other things. They'd mm. spent, you know, the better part of three years, I think three and a half years for Bo right. on doing this project, and they were understandably a bit burnt out. So my job was to come in, mm -hmm. look at the entire code base, look at the entire design, really like try to, you know, try to take in the full the full picture. And this was made in Game Maker, right? It's made in Game Maker, oh, right. yeah. Game Maker Studio One, uh, which um, has been now replaced with a slightly newer version mm -hmm. over the last couple of years. So this was slightly, slightly old software now. Um, I, for what Hyperlight was doing, I think it was the perfect software for a mm -hmm. lot of reasons, a lot of technical reasons. Um, but yeah, my job was to, to look at this whole picture and I was given quite a clear task was make this run at 60 frames a second. Okay, wow. Um, and it originally released at 30 frames a second. So okay. for people who aren't familiar with these terms, uh, 30 frames a second means that when you're looking at your screen, you are seeing a new image every one thirtieth of a second, right. which is approximately which is, 33 milliseconds. Which is kind of like what, what you see TV and yeah. movies at. Yeah, movies are traditionally shot at 24 frames a second, 24 mm. point something frames a second. All to do with, I think, gearing ratios. More yeah. To, more to do anything. Oh, my life, yeah. Well, you know, nowadays we have gearing ratios. It's just done with tiny little electronics, right? Yeah. Like, oh. I don't understand that stuff. But my job was to get it running at 60 frames a second. And the theory is, is that the higher the frame rate, the smoother the overall image looks to your right. brain. When you look at a movie, as he quite rightly brought up, 24 frames a second, it's actually blurry. If you mm. look at a freeze frame of a movie, it's blurry as hell. Mm -hmm. But your eye magically blends it all together to give the impression of motion. Games don't always work like that. And Hyperlight Drifter didn't blur stuff together. So it looked at 30 frames a second, looked quite... Um, Retro, like it, okay. it looked like it had been filmed and was shown on something quite old. Oh, okay. And they wanted it to feel smoother. They, they well, could, I mean, there's a look. I mean, you, you yeah. can have some people actually try to achieve that kind of CRT, yeah. um, not just the image, but like the response time, yeah, the, kind the of thing. feel, right? The, the, this, like, this, right. the X factor kind of, you know. This, but this, this wasn't one of those cases. Well, they really it does feel like a very fast game. I don't know. There's, there's mm. the, the, the swords, the sword swooshes, and, yeah. and things like that. And the dash the, mechanic yeah, as well. Dash, yeah, exactly. Uh, and if you have that blurred or that have that, oh, it would feel awful. It, it just feels yeah, yeah it, like, feel, it would feel laggy even though it wouldn't be right. Yeah, it'd feel like you're in rubber band. Right, right. Um, so you don't want that. And at 30 fps, it felt fine uh, and it looked fine. But Alex wanted to make the best product possible. He mm. is of his own admission. In fact, the first thing he said to me is, "You'll hate me. I'm a perfectionist." Right. Um, and I don't hate him, of course. I actually love the man a great deal. Um, 
but the fact that he he wanted to just make the product just just per, as perfect as he had in his back of his head, right? Mm-hmm. And he brought me in to do that, and uh, fortunately, I got as close as I think it was possible to get to to what was Brilliant. in Alex's head. Um, so my job was to look at the whole thing, and under the direction of Alex uh, and and his watchful gaze, to make it better, the whole mm. thing, with this slight technical improvement. Right. Um, I say slight; it was a hell of a job. But yeah, I mean, looking back at it, because this was years ago now, it was a couple of years ago. Um, I, I'm, some of the proudest work in my career is, is, is working on that stuff um, because I think it meant a lot to people mm-hmm. um, you know we attach this number 60 FPS to, mm-hmm. to something and I think we sometimes forget what that actually means the emotional connection okay um, well but, for you as a developer or yeah or, yeah. Or I, was, I was talking mostly as, as the audience as players but right. for the developers as well yeah. to be really truly proud of, of what they've made and uh, for me that's that's really important um, that's why this this whole industry is even worth it with all of the difficulties that you occasionally have. Yeah, uh, yeah. but that's a, a whole other episode. Oh my podcast. life! Yeah. yeah, I promise you, I won't yeah. get into politics. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a cutting room floor, you know. Like, oh yeah. yeah, oh boy. Anyway, anyway. Yeah. but you've also worked on uh, the Swords of Ditto. Yeah. What's yeah. What's that game like? So that game well, is <laughs> people haven't played it. Yeah. Okay. So Swords of Ditto is a funnily enough. Now that I think about it, it's kind of Zelda again. Um, okay. It's a procedurally generated link to the past. Okay. So it's big, friendly faces, happy faces, and everything smiles, everything's got eyes on it. Even the trees, even oh, the right. spooky <laughs> trees have eyes on them, right? Um, and it's very happy-go-lucky. And it's like High Flight Drifter, just kind of toned down a little bit for the difficulty, and with loads more kind of wacky content. Okay. You know, it, it's quite slapstick in a, a lot of its jokes. Um... So you have like uh, a little remote control car that you can drive around and blow up. Okay. Is that an effective yeah. weapon? Debatable. Yeah. Is it fun? Have, absolutely. Absolutely. If, if you've yeah. seen my remote control car driving skills, yes, no. It's not an effective weapon. I mean, I've seen a car crashing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's procedurally generated. Right. What did you work on on, yes. what, on the procedural side? Or so uh, my job on that one was uh, very technical. So okay. Hyperlight is kind of you know more of a, like a like a broader scale thing, but for for Swords Ditto is very technical. Mm-hmm. So I was looking at individual parts and mm-hmm. improving them, getting the most out of the most out of the game. And procedural generation was one of those parts. Mm-hmm. Um, so what procedural generation is is where you take a set of rules, and in Swords of Ditto's case, I mean this is thousands and thousands and thousands of lines mm-hmm. of code, like a book of rules effectively, mm-hmm. and you give the book of rules a number, and it goes away. And it generates an entire world, right? You know, and if you give it a different number, it will give you a different world. Now, obviously, there are limitations to this. We're right, not right. in the business of making universes. We're not playing God or anything yeah. with our with our little worlds. Well, like not not like No Man's Sky, which you, which you, literal universes from from a. I think they had a game's worth of content spread over an entire universe. Yeah, yeah. Originally, anyway, obviously it's developed, but. But I saw yeah. I saw the sizes of their downloads just as a complete aside. Is it? Oh, it's tiny. It's tiny download, and most yeah. of it's music. Yeah, yeah. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah. Even nowadays, yeah, music is one of the most ex- largest memory uses. Right. Yeah, still, which is bizarre when you think about it. Yeah. Compared to all, all the art assets of the world and stuff, yeah. it's crazy. All these um, 4K images, but you go like, yeah, but wait till the soundtrack came. Yeah, right, yeah, it has another gigabyte, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I was working on this rule book, and my job wasn't to design the rule book. That was up to the designer, that's up to my, my boss at the time, a guy mm-hmm. called Bids, Jonathan Bids. Um, and so my job was to look at the rule book, find places where the rule book could be improved. Let's just okay. say it had a lot of rules to do with generating, looking nowhere out of particular, out of Mark's window here, a <laughs> beach. It's got a rule for a beach. Right. So maybe it's too complicated. You know, beaches are mostly flat with an angle on the next to the sea, right? Yeah. We don't need anything more than that. But it might be a little bit complicated. So mm-hmm. I come along and just kind of snip a few little bits out. And if bits notices I've changed something, then I have to redo it. Right. But that's always the test. It's like, can I, how, how efficient, how, it's an engineering problem. Mm-hmm. How small can we get this rule set? Right. Uh, until it becomes still functionally perfect and still design wise does the job, mm-hmm. uh, but means that the loading times are a minute. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there are a few seconds, right? Yeah. Right, right. And oh, the, the, I think there's two ways to look at loading times, and it depends on the game. Like sometimes you actually want a pause. Like for example, yeah. in some horror games, 
is good to have a pause in the loading between levels. Yeah. Whichever way you're doing it, like, uh, let me do like a real retro version, which would be um, original Resident Evil 2 or 1, that you yeah. open the door. That's a loading time. But actually, you get the squeaky like, noise and then yeah, like... Yeah, exactly. Like we have a truck outside like beeping and cars beeping. Yeah. Like, it's for a busy great town is Brighton. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then in other games, you need to have this immediacy of, of, of the level yeah. because you're in flow, right? You, you, want, yeah. you want the player to keep on going. And you, you mentioned that some of the stuff that you worked on was, was actually the uh, being able to edit those levels... Because that flow also goes to the, the game developer, right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, that's something to remember if you're making tools to build levels. Because that's part of my job was as a tool maker. Right. So I made and maintained and improved tools to make levels. Um, and that flow state, yeah, I mean, when you click a load button to load mm. up a level on your internal tools, there's a little bit of a pause there. And sometimes that is enough to make someone lose concentration. Yeah. Uh, right. And it's human. It's just human. Mm. Like, it's not, you know not a problem but um yeah those little things they all add up and that tool making is is again something like that's gameplay of a sort it is a, oh it's totally i think it's totally a gameplay of a sort because you have to be the meta designer and stuff I yeah mean, yeah um i've always loved making tools for developers or, or tools for for administrators of systems and things like that right because really it, yeah yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's, cool. that, that's that's kind of like what i do on on a day to day basis, okay. but that's for another podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, that's what I mean by that flow state. Because you, as a as a player, you can re replay that level, right? But as a designer, that's actually money wasted, right? Yeah. It, it, yeah. It, because it you, come out, you know, yeah. genuinely, it's just like if if you could have got that level done today compared yeah. to over two days just because you had to keep on stopping to rebuild lighting I'm looking at you on Real Engine uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my god yeah it takes so long doesn't it yeah, <laughs> um, yeah those little pauses I mean, think about oh it's, you know, it's only a 10 second pause right yeah but if you're doing it like 20 times a day that starts adding up yeah. you, you know 20 times a week and then suddenly you've got a project that's 100 weeks 200 weeks long and it depends like um, how fast you're having to iterate and play mm. that, right? With procedural generation, you're pressing the, the redo region. level button every 30 seconds. Right. So that time really multiplies up very fast. So for, uh, it's always a dream about uh, procedural generation and it's something that I want to actually go deeper in, sure. uh, in, in an episode. Um, but it's like creating the, that seed, which is the, the, the magic number that you put in or you generate out of like, say, hey, randomly create me some levels and I'll choose one. You, you, you generate what's called a seed, right? Yes, and then, yeah. And that's so a your seed recipe. is the magic number that you start off with. Right. Yeah. So it's kind of your recipe that you put into your cook. Yeah, well, your recipe, so, yeah. It's the ingredient that you put into your recipe, right? Man, what, what sort of metaphor should we use here? <laughs> yeah, uh, no. yeah. I don't Look know. up seed on Wikipedia, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. pseudo-random number generator seed is kind yeah. of stuff, right? Yeah. Um, I guess it's the, it's the kind of earth that you're growing the tree in. Yeah. And depending on the type of earth, the tree looks slightly different. You can still identify that's a big ass oak tree. Yeah, yeah. But it's slightly different because of the environment, the, the right. seed that you've given it, and the, the starting conditions. And but the, the designer's job in this is for them to choose which oak tree was good. Therefore, yeah. Therefore, which one, which yeah. which seed you're going to take and make into the game, right? Yeah. So Dwarf Fortress, which is a very lo-fi but incredibly popular procedurally generated game mm -hmm. does an awful lot of this. So Dwarf oh, Fortress right. will generate entire like histories of worlds. So not only draws, you know, defines the world, defines the histories, the characters, historical characters that are in the world, and demons and, and curse words and all all manner of things. Seriously. And then it will get rid of most of it and be like, no, and most of that's rubbish. It doesn't fit the the, the pattern, my, the, the designer's pattern. And then it will choose one of these worlds out of, you know, thousands yeah. of worlds. That's one method of doing it. That's I, There's a technical term for it that escapes me now, but I'm going to call it a sieve method. Okay. So you define your sieve and you just randomly generate enough flour and you sift it until you get, you know, one of those grains of flour is something that you want. Um, Swords of Ditto looks at it another way. Okay. And there are many ways of doing these things. Uh, but Swords of Ditto has a lot of very strict rules so that as it is building the level, it will never give you a level well, <laughs> usually never give you a level, which has got problems with it. Okay. We do have some safety catches in it, so that if you create something that's... What, what kind of problem would you... Do? Or do you have okay. like a list of problems that you like, bad nav mesh, the fact that 
you can't get out of this level or that kind of thing? Or? Yeah, so parts of Swords of Ditto, especially the dungeons, have a lot of puzzles in them. Okay. So if you have a sliding block puzzle where you generate it and then you kind of go, wait, hang on, the player can't path to the switch at the end. Right. You know, the solution prevents that. Then you throw that out and you start again. Okay. But you really, for Swords of Ditto at least, you really try not to do that. Are, are the, in Swords of Ditto, are the, the levels procedurally generated for the player or the, they were procedurally generated to go into the game? That's a great question. They are procedurally generated for the player. Okay, well, yeah. okay. So every time you play the game, it's in principle, it's a different set right. of rooms. Right? So it's a really good point you bring up, actually. Um, I did kind of skip over that a little bit. Yeah. Um, no, that's fine. Yeah. So procedure generation can be used as a design tool. Yeah. Before you, you know, before you uh, put it on a disc, right? Because then, you, the then those would be like curated levels, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you're looking at curation. Yeah. But in, in sort of the, no, this is this is like oh, yeah. procedural world. This is yeah, like scary procedural generation. Like it does regularly go wrong. Um, so you but that's the kind of fun of it. It's like, it, it is, it, yeah. Because it's man versus machine in a way, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the or player versus machine, I should say. Yeah, yeah. Um, the human, the PVE content of it, right? The that that idea that you're fighting against the systems makes games like Swords of Ditto very attractive for speedrunners. It's why right. the Binding of Isaac, which is also another inspiration for Swords of Ditto, um, but it's Binding of Isaac which is a procedurally generated shooter, like, mm -hmm. like an arcade shooter, is uh, less so now, but was super popular with the speedrunning community because every time you play it, it's slightly different. Okay. And it's very unpredictable. And so you see how fast you can, how far you can go and how fast you can get there this time. Right. And then the next time you play it, it's a slightly different challenge. And it's going to be a completely different challenge. Yeah. And, and that, that's one of the things that we were, we've talked previously about were, was how speed running might affect level design and uh, game yeah. design in fact yeah, yeah, yeah. you know um because if you've got procedurally generated right each speed run is different right yeah and it's kind of like driving in a different track every time it's like how yeah. fast can you do this track well i don't know because yeah. it depends which track got generated this time right and i think there are obviously everyone does speed running for different reasons mm. but if we're going to be crude about this there are kind of two kinds of speed runner people who want to have fun doing a game fast mm -hmm. and people who want to do the game the fastest okay that's true because there's I, I, I was trying to remember I think it was Resident Evil there's like this little shortcut that you can cut out a whole part of the game by yeah. by blending through the wall or something like that yeah so a little, little yeah so that's called a glitch run right um, or, a, or a bug run or a hack run um, and you often have a no 100% no glitch is like one of the classic speedrunning categories and what that says is I'm going to get 100% of the things in the game I'm going to get every secret kill every monster right. um, you know flick every light switch kind of thing and also get to the game without kind of abusing any bugs and the geometry of the game uh, those are interesting those demonstrate mastery of the game systems but I think speedrunners are hackers I think fundamentally yeah. I think they hack rules and one set of rules are the rules that you're designed to play with the other set of rules are the rules that the designers didn't anticipate you noticing. Right. Or, the, or, also, or they're also emergent, right? They're emergent yeah. by, by, yeah. you, by one playing and then noticing that you can do this and it was yeah. never planned for you to do this. Oh, no. Yeah. No, there's a lot of stuff in Hyperlight Drifter like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hyperlight Drifter uh, was popular with the speedrunning community when it was released. There are a couple of interesting little bugs in it where if you... Uh, if you heal yourself and dash and heal yourself and dash, you can skip out the entirety of an intro sequence for the game. You, okay. You skip to where this little hidden, this little hidden room at the start of the game that you're not meant to be able to get to until like you know an hour in, um, and you could cut, completely cut that out. And you know that's uh, fine. Okay. Hashtag spoilers. For Hashtag anyone, spoilers. Right? spoilers. Yeah. Um, and there's another little bug which you can use in multiple places where if you rub against a, uh, a wall and I think you teleport and then you cancel the teleport, Yeah. then your momentum carries over, but there's this glitch with the collision system where then it will teleport you across the other side of the room. It boings you. It boing, <laughs> yeah, the camera like follows a second later because the camera does not know what's just happened. So it's like, what the hell do I do? <laughs> you just disappeared, like, where's he gone? Where the hell have we gone? So when we were looking at doing the 60 FPS conversion, doing all this, this work on Hyperlight, um, we left in a lot of these bugs. Oh, cool. Yeah, because... 
Let's take well, they still work in the different frame rates? Because I've had issues. Yeah, with like, oh, okay. uh, some of them do. Yeah. Some of them don't. And right. the ones that didn't work, we didn't put in bugs, right? That's, right, right. That's ridiculous. But some of the bugs do still work at 60 FPS. Most of them do still work at 60 FPS. And we very deliberately left a lot of those in. That's that's really interesting that you actually deliberately wanted to have them in. Unless like, someone's trying to do it, they're not gonna Yeah. They're not gonna find these things. So it doesn't affect the average player. But if we fix those bugs, man, it's making the game worse. It is making the game worse. Right. Because there's a large group of people yeah, that, that <laughs> who enjoy those little glitches. So like fun isn't one thing. Fun is Right. Loads I mean at the end of the day we're making toys for people to play with. Right? Yeah. One way or the other. Um and however they're playing with those toys, yeah, it's it's up to them. It's not it, we're, yeah. we're there to suggest, not to right. like. To can limit. Lego stop people making guns with their bricks? Right, I, I think there's a big issue about the on, online community with Lego. Yeah, well, yeah, right. And when I was a, when I was a boy, a wee lad. Yeah, a wee lad. Oh, not thirty yet, not quite. Oh, uh, when I was a boy, you weren't. You know, like they just introduced spears into Lego. Okay, they yeah. ju- I'd just done it. Because okay. spears were like, you know, it's a deadly weapon, right? Yeah, and I think they did not want to do it. And they were attached weapon. to like little characters with grass skirts, which is maybe like a bit iffy. But anyway, yeah. they had spears. And then they introduced muskets and flintlocks. Right. 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 Okay. And you yeah, see where this yeah. is going. And then they start, and they had laser guns because they had the little astro, the astro right. guy, right? And that was, that was before I was born. That was a while ago yeah. now. But they, they stopped short of actually having like an M16, kind right. of like a machine gun in there. And now it's starting to get to that point where they are using well, licensing they've got. Yeah, with licensing, it's going to be a big one, right? Yeah. Like, here's your, your I mean, I'm going to say Avengers or something like that, but... Whatever, whatever, whatever. whatever they're doing. So, that's the a debate. Matrix license. <laughs> <laughs> we need guns, lots of Lego guns. Yeah. I don't even see the code anymore, I just see Lego blocks. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, but I mean, this, this this debate goes around and around. Like, how how should people how should people play your levels? What is the correct route? And if you look at Super Mario Odyssey, they've deliberately put hidden bits on top of the levels where you're not uh, meant to go because they know people are gonna go there. Right. Some and point, that's, that's the one big out. thing about level design is like adding stuff like the people. Yeah. In theory, shouldn't be able to, but they will. They have. Someone will find out how to do it. <laughs> um, if you look at, I think it's Tomb Raider 2. It might be the original Tomb Raider, yeah. but one of the early Tomb Raiders. There is a health pack in one of the later levels on a ledge that through the established rules of the game, you shouldn't be able to get to. And it's right, you can see it. It's right there on a ledge. You can just about see the top of it. And you shouldn't be able to get to it. The thing is, is that the designers designed the room in such a way that it exploited a glitch in the game. So the designer, the level designer, knew there was a glitch. And he used that to build a secret wow. into the level. Yeah. Um, and it's a well-known, it's a well-known well, glitch. Well, now, well, I mean, it's, it's well-known now. now but yeah, because no, it's not this no, podcast. No, no, no um, yeah, yeah. Well, now everyone knows, but like yeah. at the time of release, right? Yeah. Like, at the time of design. Yeah, like you actually, you've. it's not like, oh, it's a weird momentum bug. Like you clip through something to get there. Right. Um, so it's, it's definitely... Not especially, meant to be especially if it, well, I guess like in Tomb Raider one and two, like that would have been completely different. Yeah, type, but, yeah Cause it's all grid based, volumes. right? So yeah. Tomb Raider one and Tomb Raider two, and I think Tomb Raider three is as well. Um, they are based on cells, so when you run, you lock to the next cell. Yeah, which is why it feels a little bit uh, unresponsive sometimes. But yeah, the whole game's built on these cells and and the physics that controls that is yeah, super interesting stuff. Yeah. I love that stuff. It's great. Juju, where could someone find you if they wanted to to ask you more questions about procedural gen or anything? Anything, 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 anything game anything maker. That anything game maker. T- podcast. Um, so it, the easiest way to get in touch with me, and I love I love answering people's questions. I actually get like a couple of questions every day. Um, don't be afraid to to reach out to me though. Um, I actually really enjoy passing on information and uh, sharing with people what I have learned in my brief game dev career. So the easiest way to get in touch with me is through Twitter. So that's at Juju Adams. Or if you're an email kind of person, and I respect that, then it's contact at jujuadams.com. That's awesome. It's having like a domain name after your name is great. Yeah, Juju yeah. Adams is pretty rare. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that one had not gone yet, and not, it was very cheap. Isn't it very nice? Yeah. Uh, you can get in contact with the podcast if you have any questions uh, that you'd like to ask me at, um, at Mark Drew, or for the podcast is at Level Design FM. And we'll talk to you next time. And see you soon, and hopefully I'll be back on the show and we can ask you more questions. Thank you very much, Mark. I'd love to come back. Awesome. Bye. Bye.